and welcome to today's segment of The Power of Money. I'm your host, Michelle Graves, nationally and internationally known as the Money Lady, having spent the last 30 years in the fields of finance, money management, and international economics. And we're today going to have as my very special guest for this next hour, Ray Copenhaver, who is a long-term care specialist in the Ohio marketplace. And he is going to be sharing with me and with you as my viewers all of the intricacies of long-term care. Now before you say, eh, doesn't have anything to do with me, you are so wrong. The statistics are not in favor of that type of thinking. And so we're going to open up that whole world and remove much of the fright that many of you may have about aging and about long-term care. Can I afford it? Will I lose everything? What do I do now? So this is the focus of today's show, and we're going to be literally taking you inside of Mr. Copenhaver's world, and we've got uh, actual uh, visuals so that you can follow along with us as we talk about this vital subject. And without a lot of uh, further conversation, I'd like to go on and introduce you to my guest for the next hour, and we'll be talking about the ins and outs of long-term care. And how are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Michelle. Good, good, good. Glad to have you here, Thank Mr. Cover. Give us a little bit of background about who you are and why you think I have you on. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're here for a very important uh, subject, but uh, just in the way of introduction, I'm Ray Copenhaver and been a Dayton, Ohio resident for almost 50 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm delighted to have an opportunity to be a part of this event uh, because we have an important message to, uh, to bring, an important message to offer, and that is the importance of uh, planning for our future, especially as we begin to go in through our adult and uh, in our senior years. I'm a specialist in uh, long-term care insurance uh, but it's so much more than that. We feel, those of us who are in this field, we feel that we have an educational uh, obligation as well as a planning obligation. So in addition to marketing and selling what you might call the long-term care insurance plan, we do many educational uh, events such as this. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to do a workshop or a seminar in a church or in a senior center and we're just in hopes that we can share that type of communication today. I'm so delighted that you came on. And let's talk about what is long-term care and the crisis in this industry. And then we'll begin to just go on through the visuals and have you talk about the subject matter as we get started. But just as an intro, what is the crisis facing America today in the area of aging and long-term care? Well, I, I like the way you phrase it, the crisis uh, today, because it has increased and continues to increase. There's a popular statistic that most of us are hearing that on an average, approximately 10,000 people uh, each day in America reach the age of 65. And most of us relate the age of 65 to a possible date when someone would retire. Uh, most of us know that age, age 65 is the correct age for people to be looking at Medicare for their health insurance. And so there's many planning milestones that are based around that age of 65. Uh, what we'll share a little later on is if I do my Medicare arrangement at age 65, I have stepped into a new world for health insurance but I haven't addressed what is called long-term care. Medicare is a health insurance type policy for what they call acute care and medical attention. Whereas, as we'll learn a little later on, long-term care is more our very personal activities and the ability to function in, in, in life. So let me ask you this question, Ray. Why do you think that people have been hesitant uh, about long-term care because I do a lot of reading and of course you train me 
and I've been a strong proponent for 20 years of people doing this, but I keep hearing people comparing Medicare to Medicaid, using them interchangeably. And I think that's caused some confusion. And then on some of the uh, venues I've gone on to, they always talk about you may not need it or it's too expensive. We'll be covering uh, each one of those uh, topics in detail okay. in, in a bit. But first, uh, as a good overview, Medicare and Medicaid are two entirely different uh, government programs. You might think of Medicare as a program that is available to you at 65, but it's a program that's not free. There are costs associated with Medicare, and uh, we pay those uh, through a premium that are part of our Social Security compensation. Also, most of us know that during our working years, there's a deduction that comes out of our paycheck uh, that's called Medicare. So we have been paying towards that program before we retire, and then there's an additional small cost when we do require, or when we do retire. We are, we are delighted to have coverage called Medicare, but Medicaid is available there, and it's available for all of us in America if we have what is called needs-based. That means that we need care, we need expensive attention, but we do not have the income or the resources to pay for it. So it's really a program for the poor and indigent. That would be the best way yes. to describe mm -hmm. it, yes. Right, okay. Yes. There seems to be a lot of confusion about that, but let's get started with uh, your presentation. And if we can go to the first slide, and you can share uh, with that if we could get our camera crew to bring up that first slide as an introduction. Yeah, okay, you got it, Ray. Okay, well, the introduction that we'll, that we'll do here will be actually a sequence of three items. Michelle likes when we start out first with addressing the details, what is long-term care, and then we move into the cost of the long-term care, and you might call that the problem. We're going to need long-term care, and it's costly. And then Michelle and I would like to elaborate on what are the solutions. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. Can we go to the next slide? Okay. All righty. Like Just to... hold it there, if you would. Okay, thank you. We'd like to call this the good news and the bad news. The good news, we're going to live longer, and most of us can expect to uh, have a, a, a lifespan possibly longer than our, uh, our parents or at least longer than our grandparents because today medical science and uh, the world that we live in uh, just has more ways to treat illnesses. So most of us will live a long life. In fact, the average of a, of a uh, lady, once that lady has reached age 65, there's a strong possibility that lady will live until 90. That's uh, good man, news. That's good news. That is. Mm -hmm. And a man at age 65 will, leave, will live a, a life expectancy to close to 85. Okay. What's interesting, Michelle, uh, it's reported by the government now that a married couple at age 65, one of them at least will live till 90. That's very good news. So the good news is we'll live long. Okay. The bad news is we'll live long. We'll live long. <laughs> and what, okay. we what we chose there, rather than the word long-term care, yeah. we chose the word there, extended care. And what that extended care means is an extended period of time beyond Medicare help. Okay, got beyond it. Beyond Medicare help. Can we go to the next slide? Okay. This is the one that we like to uh, spend a little time on. So in the yellow box, we call that home. Home is where we all want to spend our, our time, whether we're age 65 or whether we're age 95. Most of us would want to reside in our home rather than some other type of, uh, of a location, such as a hospital or a nursing home. Right. But the smaller boxes there in blue show some of the type of attention that we may need in our lifetime. You'll see one of the boxes there says adult daycare. That means that we might need some help 
at a location, possibly a church that helps seniors during the day. We might need hospital or hospice. We might need home care. And a little later in this presentation, we'll talk about long-term care insurance. And what Michelle and I like to do with, uh, in the beginning part is to explain that if we want to stay home, and if that's our desire, and that's our choice, then we should have a long-term care insurance policy because that allows us to get our care in the home. Can we go to the next slide? Why might we need long-term care, Michelle? Most of us mm -hmm. can relate to a, a parent or possibly a, a, an aunt or an uncle who was impacted by one of these me serious medical situations. When I was a younger person and I watched my aunts and my uncles as they aged, at times one of them would have a heart attack or a stroke and it was not uncommon for them then to pass away within one day, two or three days. Okay. Today in America, we are blessed, not only in America, but in the world, we're blessed whereby a stroke or a heart attack is corrected or at least is remedied in the hospital such that the person will not die, but sometimes the person will still need then some help, extended help because of that. So the 10 reasons shown on this slide show us why people will eventually die, but it's also why people might need that extended, extended long-term care. care. I'm looking at some very common, the Alzheimer, which is epidemic now, and, um, and the related dementia, diabetes, type 2 probably, uh, osteoporosis, which uh, disproportionately impacts on women, yes. um, heart disease, Parkinson's, arthritis, Cancer, cancer is a big one, cancer. and um, these are leading causes for the extended care, correct? They are. One, Michelle, one that surprised me a little bit until I researched a little bit more uh, why many people might need care in a nursing home because mm -hmm. of cancer. Well, I believe what you'll find is that today the treatment of cancer can keep us alive. Right. However, we might get into more of a frail or less of a strong position where maybe doing our, our normal functioning of life might be impaired and that's where long-term care comes in because long-term care is either a physical or a cognitive impairment. Okay, when you say cognitive, for our viewers, what are you saying? Thank you. The cognitive impairment, most of us would use the expression of Alzheimer's. Okay. However, there are other forms of dementia. Alzheimer's is the one that we most often hear, and that is one of 30 different forms of dementia. My goodness gracious, that is something. Um, let's go to the next slide. Probably of all the uh, slides, Michelle, that we'll talk about today, this may be the most important because it enables us to look at the definition of long-term care. Okay. Most people have their own way of, of uh, describing long-term care because they, they link it to their mother or their grandparent mm -hmm. who needed nursing type care. But let's take a look at it. Long-term care is chronic and it's important that we describe the chronic care a bit. Chronic care is not medical attention. Chronic care is not part of your doctor-driven type of services. In fact, most chronic care does not even involve a nurse. Chronic care means someone has to help me do basic things that I really take for granted until I cannot do them. And on this slide, we show six different things that are called activities of daily living. Okay. When we lose the capability of bathing ourselves, dressing, eating, toileting. The fifth one there called transferring means we're not able to get out of bed or out of a chair alone, or if we have problems maintaining continence, then those are called activities of daily living that someone has to help us with. And I think most of us will agree we don't need a physician to do our bathing and dressing. Right, but you do need the care. 
but we need that care. Yes. We need that. Mm -hmm. So that's what's called, Michelle, a physical impairment. And sometimes that physical impairment might be short in nature. And if it is, that's a blessing. There are other times when that type of care might be for the lifetime, for the okay. remainder of your lifetime. So that's your physical impairment uh, uh, problem of long-term care. And then the other component is the Alzheimer or the dementia type situation called cognitive impairment. So most people, when things happen medically that now impact on them long term, beyond the doctor, yes. then we're talking about the custodial type of care or extended care, correct? Yes, thank you. Okay, just wanted to make sure my definitions were correct right. for our viewers. Right. So that's major. That's and major. I'm glad, and I'm glad you used the word the doctor. Typically, the doctor would not be involved in a chronic type uh, care, mm -hmm. may not even be involved in the design of the plan of care. Okay. However, we might use a professional, such as a licensed social worker. Mm -hmm. What will be the type of care that will best help that person live their life? Right. And the quality of life is very important. When you've been sick and you would want to have at least be in a situation where you are going to have excellent supportive care for these types of things, yes. wouldn't you say? Yes. Okay, let's go to the next slide. This elaborates just a little bit more, but we feel it's important that we talk about these categories. Long-term care can be the bottom part there called skilled care. Okay. But if it is the bottom part of skilled care, there's good news. Typically, good news is the skilled care will not last long. Skilled care is under the direction of a doctor, and it is rehabilitation in nature. Okay. It is therapy in nature, and it's intended to help the person get better. Okay. So it's not uncommon for an example situation like this where a person would have a stroke, would be hospitalized initially, would be then discharged from the hospital to a nursing home that has what we call skilled nursing facility okay. capabilities. Okay. Then they would do rehabilitation, they would do therapy for that person in hopes that the person then could go home. The person could return to their active lifestyle and in many cases that is what happens. I do want to mention the skilled care if you're age 65 or older is paid for by Medicare. Okay, but aren't there some some restrictions on that in terms of progression, meaning if for Medicare to pay you have to show improvement? That is true. Okay, now how does that work? Okay, we'll go into that in greater detail, but let's touch upon that right now. Okay. Let's just picture that we're over 65, okay. and therefore we're on Medicare, which means Medicare is our health coverage. And if we do need the skilled care, then for a period of time, Medicare would be paying for that in full. Okay. And that would be an, we would be entitled to that by being over 65 and being on Medicare. But in a few slides later, we'll show that that is often limited to 20 days. Okay, that's not enough. And then. There can be, so we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Okay. Now, the other two categories on the slide. Can we go back to that slide that we just did? Okay, right. The other two categories uh, are more frequently not helped in any way by Medicare. Okay. Medicare being a government program that we paid for when we were younger, and we pay a little premium for now, so we're entitled to it. So let's go to custodial care. Custodial care if you can picture a family member that you know or that you did know that was in a nursing home or that was in assisted living, they were getting what is called custodial care. It's a maintenance type, whatever the person needs so they can live their life. Okay. And so that possibly they can be, they can be dressed and they can be clean and they can be fed. Okay. Now in between custodial care and skilled care is one called intermediate care, and that means the person's getting custodial care, but also frequently they may get some higher level care called nursing. 
Okay. So a nurse would actually come into the home or in the facility. That could happen, yes, correct? Yes, Okay. Mm -hmm. All righty. Okay. Right. We want to go to the next slide. Okay. This is just more detailed examples, Michelle, of the type of care that you and I might call long-term care. So, for example, if someone has chronic severe pain, they may not really call it long-term care, mm -hmm. but it's in one of those categories, and it means the person needs some help. The person needs some attention. Uh, rehabilitation is usually short in nature. So I always call rehabilitation possibly a little bit of good news. I'm going to be th have received the therapy, and then I'm going to get better. That's good. Long-term care is not typically a short period of time. It's okay. long. Okay. All right. That's why they call it. That's why they call it long-term long -term care. Long-term care. Okay. Yes. Continue. Right. Do we want to move to our next slide? Okay. There we are. We may find this of interest. Those of us who are especially numbers related, uh, in America, we have over 315 million people. That's our population uh, today. And approximately 14 million people are getting what we call the long-term care. Notice, if you will, home care, so we made that larger type, 10.7 million of the 14 million people are at home. Okay, getting care. And Michelle, that's where they want to be. Okay. We want to get our I, care I want at them home. to be at home. Yeah. I would However, think so. there are people, 1.2 million and almost a million in assisted living that are outside of the home. Okay. Now, eventually we'll talk a little bit about the cost of these, uh, of the uh, type of care. And I want to share uh, with us that home care might just be as expensive as it is for a skilled nursing facility if I need care more than 10 or 12 hours a day. I understand. And, and, stay, and staying at home, you have the comfort of the familiar. But again, you do, you are pri paying for private care, correct? That is true. Okay, which might tend to be more expensive. That is, and, and the other thing with home care, most of us would rather stay at home. Right. But we can only put, we can only ask for so much of the family. We can only ask so much of the caregiver. And uh, it would be very stressful for someone to have 24 hours around the, the, the clock. clock every gosh, day gosh, on the caregiver. Gosh, gosh, right? Yeah, that, that's, that's unbearable. But yet many people are there today. That is true. And uh, we're seeing people that, that cannot afford or choose to stay at home and somebody has to step to the table or somebody's, it may be multiple family members. It might be suggested of those 10.7 million people at home that probably less than one million would have any insurance ah, assistance. Okay. So they'd be using their family income and resources uh, to pay for whatever care that they'd be getting. That's hard. And that's a negative. And we'll talk about okay. solutions to that okay. uh, problem. All righty. Let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Okay. What we're continuing to do here is to elaborate the problem. Okay. And that is the problem of needing long-term care. And some of, these, uh, uh, some of those numbers there are a bit small. But I'd like to dwell just on male and female. Okay. Because the woman in America tends to outlive the man by five or six years, and because many of long-term care needs are at the end of the life, a woman will tend to need care somewhere between three and four years on average. Okay. And we want to realize that's an average. So you may remember your grandmother needing care for seven, eight, or nine years. Well then maybe there was another example where someone needed care just six months. Mm -hmm. But the overall care need for a woman is almost four years and a man about a year and a half. Because hmm. you all probably die. We die. There's yeah. a shorter life mm -hmm. uh, span of the man. Okay. Another interesting thing, Michelle, in my travels and visiting of nursing homes, you'll find that women in a nursing home do tend to adjust their lifestyle and they begin to accept that that's their community that's where they live okay with a little bit more of a positive spirit 
what I have noticed is the men somewhat give up. Okay. And I guess and that's just, just a trait yes, of, a, yes. of us men. Yes, right. Well, they like their home. They are the king of the castle. That's probably the and answer. And moving to it. into an, an, an uh, a institutional setting has got to be depressing. It is very depressing. I would have to think that. And, it, have... and it's depressing for more than the person needing the care. Mm. It, it impacts the entire family. Yes, yes, yes. We have one of the professionals that I work with that has uh, coined an expression, uh, long-term care doesn't just happen to you. It happens oh. to those you love. Right, because they're there with you, and they're walking through that with you. Yes. Let us go to the next slide. These are some statistics uh, that we uh, obtained from the Ohio Own Your Future catalog that was put out by uh, the government a couple years ago. It's a little bit alarming because it suggests that when we reach 65, 69 percent of us before we die are going to need long-term care. That's almost that's a, seven that out of ten. That is an astounding statistic. That's when almost you seven that out of ten. Seven out of ten people. And if you're a lady, okay, and you are, yes, your odds are actually 79 percent. So almost eight out of ten women will be impacted by care beyond the hospital. Yes. Care beyond the doctor attention before they die. That is absolutely a sobering. It's almost alarming. Yeah, it, it is. Without um, that, that's that's hard. So it goes back to our opening slide. Good news, we're going to live, live long. longer. But bad news, bad we're going to live. We're going to live, live longer. <laughs> right. You're right. You're and, right. And need that extended care. Yes, we do. Can yeah. we go to the next slide? Okay. We like to compare the second slide and think about the first slide uh, in tandem. For example, you'll see the one column there that says 31 percent. Well, that's the 31 percent of Americans that will not need long-term care. Now let's address the 69 percent who will need long-term care. Notice if you will 17 percent of the people that will need care will not need it a long time. It'll be okay. less than a year that they'll need care. 12 percent about a year to two, 20 percent two to five years. Let's stop there for a second. If you add those percentages up Okay. They're 49 percent. So it's suggesting to us that while most of us are going to be impacted by that need of long-term care, about 49 percent, or let's round that off to 50 percent, will not need it for five years or more. We'll okay. need it probably for about two years. Okay. So if you will, in our mindset, we should feel comfortable that if we need long-term care, most of us will need it about two years. Now, is that true for females? Well, if we take male, female okay. all together and, and determine how much care we'll need, two years would be a good average. Okay. Might want to make it two and a half. Okay. There are, however, and you might have seen this in your family, people who need it for eight years, nine years right, or right, more. Right, right, right. So about 20% of people who need it need it more than five years. Well, I'm going to, to present a thought to you. Given the fact that we are facing an epidemic in Alzheimer, and Alzheimer, it, there is no cure, there's no treatment, and there's no prevention, and it's a 15-year disease, then I'm thinking those statistics probably underestimate what is coming down the pike. I think that would be a good observation. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think what you're suggesting is if we're looking at two and a half to three years as an average need right. today, today, will mm -hmm. that possibly enlarge? And more than likely, it will. Yes. There, there's no answer for the Alzheimer's uh, no. situation. Uh, and the Alzheimer's person, many times, I've heard is an overall average of about eight years, mm -hmm. many times will get the care by the family okay. in the initial two, three, or four years. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, which would make it more acceptable if they had to go into an Alzheimer facility. Yes. Okay, yes. all righty. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next, uh, okay. This allows us to sum up, uh, shall we say, sum up the problem. Okay. And the problem is 
uh, we're becoming an aged society with the 10,000 people every day reaching 65. We show the average age uh, expectant of a woman mm -hmm. and, or a man. Uh, we talk again about that statistic, 69% mm -hmm. needing care. And if I may suggest, a little later on, Michelle and I will talk about uh, she'll use the expression, the elephant in the room. Oh, yeah. Even though we have this 69% need, uh, most of us don't see it or we don't want to see right, it. Right, right. It's, so, it's a hard piece. It's just hard, Ray, right. for people to, I don't know, as I said, I'm 61. It's, it, I can't believe I'm here, but I am, <laughs> and I'm only getting older every day. I think there is, for, for many people, there's a reluctance to accept the inevitability of aging and that things have to change and that you have to make the necessary adjustments as you grow older. Right. That's just my, my perspective. And I think another interesting way to, to maybe elaborate on that is uh, like an automobile. Yes. If we keep an automobile long enough, it will require more maintenance than what it did when it was newer. We pretty much take that for granted. We understand that. But if you keep an automobile long enough, uh, things that would never need attention, like maybe the steering wheel, mm -hmm. uh, might need some attention. Right, exactly. Well, go with me in, in your life. It might be the same way. If we live long enough, then things that uh, currently were okay and capabilities that we had in our life mm -hmm. uh, may be restricted just because we need a little bit more maintenance. That's very good. Can we go to our next slide now? What's the cost of this problem? So we summer, Michelle and I summarized the problem. Yeah. The problem is many of us will need some attention and the attention is not really covered by government programs uh, that we have paid for. It might, it might be a, a, a situation where we need to pay for it ourselves. What's the cost? Well, we show home care here, we show assisted living, and then we show the nursing home care. None of us would raise our hand if the question was, do you want to live your life in a nursing home? Correct. Yet we're blessed in knowing that we have that facility available if we need it. Nursing home can run, as we show here, currently as, as high as 90000 a year. That would be 7,500 per month. Home care can average around 50,000 a year. Not only is that a lower cost than a nursing home, mm -hmm. but that's where I want to stay. Right. Now, I'd like to elaborate on one squeezed in there between home care and nursing care, and that is called assisted living. Assisted living can be a very powerful solution, especially for a single person, mm -hmm. someone who is, is not married, possibly were widowed or a widow, and so, or possibly someone never married, mm -hmm. that would leave their residence and then make their new residence for their life assisted living. That is a wonderful solution, but there's a cost involved to that. And again, we'll talk a little later on about uh, long-term care insurance and I want to share and have us in the back of our mind that home care, assisted living, and nursing would be paid by our insurance policy. Can we just uh, hold the thought a minute on this issue of assisted living? Because there, there is exploded. It is exploded. Is this where literally a person moves into a facility uh, where they have minimal care? They just don't want the headache of, of being at home any longer, is that what that's about? That's the best way to describe it. It would be someone who chose to uh, no longer try to stay in their home, okay. in the community, but still would like a private residence. Okay. So picture this, Michelle. If I'm in assisted living and my room number is 112, when I close the door to 112, I'm in my own living room. I have my own television. I have my own microwave and kitchenette in mm -hmm. my own private bath mm -hmm. and that in a sense is still the person's home. Well I've been in, in some very nice facilities. They say they don't keep staff, medical staff on 24-7. or It's different. It's not the same as a nursing home. That it's is not true. as intense but they do have access 
And you have the flexibility again of being in a situation, as I understand it, where if something does happen, you have access to immediate care. Is that correct? That's the way I would describe assisted okay. living. Okay. For example, in a nursing home, we may have a ratio of X number of people to each nurse. Okay. Or X number of patients to each aid. Whereas in an assisted living, most of them today would probably have a nurse on board at all times. Okay. But maybe one nurse on board and the other folks would be aides. However, so let's let's say that we take a small assisted living of 50 rooms. Okay. Uh, they may have four or five aides available and one nurse. But th there would be a nurse always available. Okay. Many of the... Uh, Many of the needs of us in assisted living are managing medications. Okay. Managing Explain medications. to me how that works. This would be someone, and not necessarily someone that has dementia or Alzheimer's, but someone who is just at the point where their regimen of medications is complicated, is complex. Okay. And so if I'm in assisted living, morning, noon, and evening, whatever that frequency is, they'll take that responsibility. So my children would know that dad is in assisted living and he is receiving his medications properly and at the right time. That's very nice. I like that concept, really, as an interim, because <laughs> I really I understand uh, the beauty of having your own home, Ray, but having your own home as a widow may not be the best thing because the homes are typically older stock they need repairs, uh, cleaning a house is a charge and a chore, cooking, all of those things that when you're younger with children are not a challenge, become more of a challenge as you become older. Yes, ma'am. I just saying that as a single woman myself, I truly, and I have a home, I do not enjoy doing this stuff anymore, Ray. I really don't. I prefer to eat out or have my food prepared and to be able to interface with people as I want. And it does seem like the assisted living may be an answer for a lot of people. Let's elaborate a little bit more. Okay. What you're saying is so true. Uh, I'm on a committee of the uh, elderly, and we meet uh, for our board meetings monthly at an assisted living uh, center. Okay. And our meeting is from 4 o'clock until 5, but many times it'll run maybe a little past 5 o'clock. But when we leave that conference room of this assisted living, we go by the dining area. Yes. And Michelle, it's so rewarding. First of all, the smell is like a fine restaurant. Really? So the odor of the food is such that, mm, and it's quarter after five, I, I want to get <laughs> home. But, but what I'm suggesting is as we go by, as we go by the dining room, mm -hmm. I'll look into the dining room. And here's what you'll see. You'll see one table with a single person sitting there, man or woman, mm -hmm. And that's because that's what they want. They, they would like to be private. They're having their meal alone. Another table, you'll see a man and woman, possibly man mm -hmm, and wife, mm -hmm. enjoying their meal. Mm -hmm. Another table, you'll see, let's say, three ladies and, and a gentleman. Okay. And they're having their meal, and they're having conversation. And sometimes I look and I say, you know, this isn't bad. Well, I, I've looked, and I'm telling you, Ray, uh, particularly since so many seniors in my years of practice, one of the challenges I have is a sense of isolation because they don't go to church anymore. They don't interface with people. They sit in front of that television constantly. And so their socialization is, is an issue. And at least in this kind of an environment, and I didn't want to diverge into assisted living, but I really think it is a thought and a, uh, an answer to many seniors who may not have considered that option as an interim. Well, I think as it's a good interim. discussion point. Okay, all right. And what you and I are sharing is if we need care uh, and attention beyond the home, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be wonderful if assisted living could be the solution? Right, right. And in a little bit we'll talk about it can be, and if we had that wonderful solution, the insurance product, it would be paid for. Let's go to the next video. Okay. This just shows a little bit more of the cost uh, and puts it in terms of times. Uh, for example, if someone needed care today, Michelle, let's assume $200 might be the average cost. 
And if that person would need care for that average of two and a half to three years, notice that we're looking at a cost, a total cost of $219,000. May I suggest most of us do not have a little extra savings account with $219,000 in. We would look at that and we would say, how are we going to pay for that? And that's at $200 a day. That that's is the low day. end. Now, for example, Michelle, you mentioned how old you were. Mm -hmm. So let's suppose that you have at least 20 years before you would need that care. So we can go to that chart at that $200. We can move down. That cost will be 500 a day for you when you would be at age where you might need long-term care. Yeah. So let's go over now, Michelle, for you, three years for you, $547,000. So Jeez. hopefully you're putting away a large amount every week so that you will have 547000 My God, I can assure you Social Security is not going to meet that gap. That's not going to happen. And thank you for saying Social Security. Social Security would be the money that Michelle would be receiving to live on. Right. To buy your food and to pay the utilities, not to pay someone for your care. Right. I think that's a real challenge today as we look at seniors that are staying in the home, Ray, because they really, outside of Social Security, so many of them do not have the means. I mean, statistically, we know that many of the older women that are widows, the average income is, is less than $700 a month because they didn't work. Their husbands work. Right. Now, they have their little CDs and their other yes. pools of money, but that is not enough. Let's move on to the next slide. This, sum, this somewhat summarizes what we've said so far. Okay. And then we're going to go in and talk about the solutions. Okay. But this summarizes that long-term care is expensive. Long-term care is very likely to happen. Yes. 69 percent. Yes. And long-term care is not covered by the government. Oh, your neighbor across the street may want to debate that with you. Mm -hmm. But long-term care is not covered by the government unless we are in a category called poor. Right. You have no assets. That is true. Nothing. Right. Medicaid. I'm going to say again to those of us that are, view that are watching, Medicaid is not Medicare. Medicaid is extended care. It is long-term in duration, known as custodial care and it is for the poor under the guidelines of Medicaid currently and they are changing becoming even tighter the most you can have right now is fifteen hundred dollars um, that's bottom line so you can't talk about Medicaid until you are completely depleted is that not correct Ray? That is true. Okay that's, true. that's major most seniors still say in the back of their mind that the government's going to take care of them. And I'm like, well, the government may, when you're penniless, and you may not like what you wind up looking at. Is that fair? That's fair. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So now we'll talk about, uh, if we can go to the next slide. Okay. This is, this is a comparison as to why we might want to consider the solution called long-term care insurance. And I'd like to stay with this slide for just a moment. First of all, most of us who own an automobile and are driving will have the car covered by insurance. In fact, in Ohio and most states, you need to carry evidence of insurability in your glove box. But notice the odds of using that car insurance are rather good in your favor, one out of 260. Mm -hmm. So that means each year, one person out of 260 will have to use their car insurance. Right. Now, I'm not suggesting that you would not keep your car insurance. You want to keep that. But notice that it's a risk that has a high odds of not happening. Exactly. Now, the next box on the slide, can we if we can go back to that, uh, go back to the other one if we could. Go We're back, going to talk yeah. about now your homeowner's insurance. Let's go forward. The okay. homeowner's insurance, and again, if we have a mortgage, the mortgage company will, ins will demand that we have coverage. But even if the home no longer has a mortgage, most of us go to bed and sleep a little better at night mm -hmm. if we know we have the home covered. 
But notice the odds of having a fire in your home are 1 in 1,200. Rather remote that it would happen. And look what the cost is. If you do have a fire, the house doesn't burn down. It's usually $11,000 as the average cost. Now let's move to the next column. Long-term care is the risk that we're talking about today. Right, right. And it's one that most people are not totally taken care of yet. But notice the odds here. I've taken the odds down from 69% to one out of two. I'm saying let's assume that the government statistics are exaggerated. Okay. Let's just assume one out of two of us. That means, Michelle, either you or me are, are going, going to need it. Right, exactly. And either you or me will not, but we don't know right, who it right, will be. Right. But notice our average cost will probably be over $100,000 today in today's dollars. In today's dollars, dollars right. Now, I want to sneak over to the last column. In a few moments, we're going to talk about the Ohio Partnership Plan. And that is a new plan that makes long-term care insurance more appropriate. So we'll hold that thought for okay. just a moment. Okay, all righty. Let's go to the next slide. Oops. Yeah, here well, we are. This sums up some of the other statistics. We can probably move on by, by just glancing at that for a little bit. I'd like to go to the very bottom one on the right. Home is where the heart is. Mm -hmm. Assisted living could be my home. It could be. Especially for a single person who no longer wants to have the responsibility of the home, mowing the grass, raking the leaves, but needs some help. Right. And we'll talk about assisted living and how the insurance could help there. Okay. Well, let's go on to our next slide. We're moving right along here. Okay. <clears throat> okay. We need to move to our next slide. Speaking of home, as we're waiting for the slide to turn. Okay. Oh, I see. What we had planned to do was to talk through each of these elements okay. here. Okay, okay. <clears throat> uh, so let's stay with the, with the, uh, the column there on the right. <clears throat> if we need long-term care, we will have choices if we can pay for it. Okay. Notice this. I mentioned choices if we can pay for it. If we do not have the money to pay for it, then the choices are limited. So let's take a scenario here. Let's take someone who needs care, and that might be a basic thing of helping them bathe mm -hmm. and helping them dress. Okay. The two very things that most of us want to have every day. That person has a choice of getting the care of their home if they can afford it. Okay. Or if the care is available. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. The person has a choice to go to the nursing home. Right. The disadvantage of a nursing home is, first of all, I'm no longer at home. Secondly, most of us will be in a room with another person. Right. We will not be afforded the personal right. private room. And also... If I like my meal at a certain time of day, I'll need to alter that schedule. Right. I'll have to get my meal when the meals are delivered. Takes me back to my mother when she was in the nursing home. She liked her coffee in the morning. Mm -hmm. First my, thing out, yeah. My, okay. mother, my mother was a two coffee or maybe more cups in the morning. But she wasn't ready for it right away. Okay. She really wanted to have her coffee when she wanted it. So in the nursing home, it was basically, there's your coffee, and you don't have to drink it now. But when she would drink the coffee, it was no longer warm. Exactly, yeah. So nursing home takes away your personal living options. Also, it's expensive. Yes, it is. So $200 a day. Most nursing homes today in our area would be more than that. But let's use a $200 mm -hmm. a day, $6,000 per month. How are you going to pay for that? Michelle, that's 72000 a year. Ray, that is what I ask people regularly. It's just how are you going to pay? But again, it's been my experience that people go into a zone. It's kind of like buying um, death insurance. It's like, that's not going to happen to me. And I'm like, believe me, the probability of it happening to you is quite high. 
And if you do not become proactive for yourself, then it will be imposed upon you. And so that's the reason that we're having this conversation. I refuse at this point in my personal private practice to even talk about investment assets with retirees who have not covered long-term care because it's the elephant in the living room. You're going to you're going to go into a facility and you're going to spend all of the money you have earned through investments to pay for your care, then become penniless and then go on to Medicaid? What about your children? What about your heirs? What about your church? What about you? But it's a hard place for many people to get to. Another way of maybe uh, summarizing mm -hmm. the, the problem. Most of us need education with respect to long-term care. Yes. If we could go back to where we were talking about a comparison of your car, a comparison of your home to long-term care, let's talk about the home coverage. There's none of us that need to be educated about the fact that our home could have a fire. Right. That a fire could occur in our home. So there's not an education required there. We all know that of situations where it happens. People have houses so most of down. us, most of us, automatically get a hold of the insurance company, and they and we say we want to have coverage, and certainly we'll we'll try to to get the best coverage mm -hmm. from the lowest dollar. Now, Michelle, in what you and I do in working with people in Ohio, we have to help educate. First of all, what is the long-term care? Help Americans and help people in Ohio to understand what is long-term care and why it's not paid for by health insurance, or call that Medicare. Mm -hmm. But we have to remember, if we're not over 65, health insurance works the same way. It doesn't cover long-term care. So you and I have an obligation to help people know and learn about what long-term care is. And one of, the, one of the best ways to do that is to help the person draw upon their remembering grandma, mm -hmm. grandfather, aunts and uncles who at the end of their life needed some help. Okay. Now that help in years past was provided by the home. Okay. The people in the home. Most of us didn't remember grandmother going to the nursing home. They were kept by one daughter. And right. then another daughter would step in. In today's society, we're spread all over America. Yeah. And it's not uncommon for people no longer to live in the same city as their parents. Well, can we talk quickly in the remaining time? Time has zipped by, Ray, about the Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, these partnership, partnership. plans. Yeah, and let's talk about that real quick. This was brought on by the federal government three years ago, opening up the option for every state to have a partnership plan. And let's use Ohio as our example. Ohio now is encouraging everyone in Ohio to buy a long-term care policy that is called partnership qualified. Then if the policy called long-term care pays out for my home care or pays out for my nursing mm -hmm. home care, the policy pays out certain amount of dollars, then for every dollar that the insurance company pays out, I have protected one dollar equal to every dollar they pay as protection so that Ohio would allow me to go on Medicaid then and I'd have Wonderful. all those assets protected. That is powerful. So an example, your okay. plan would pay out for you, Michelle, $100,000 of benefits. Okay. And then the insurance company may wave goodbye to you because that's what you bought. Right. Then Ohio would allow you to keep $100,000 of savings Got it. and still go on Medicaid rather than spending down to $1,500. Woo! That is perfect. It's huge. That's huge. And so many people don't even know. Our responsibility is to carry we that must, message. We must tell them. We're trying to do We're, that message today. Yes, that is the message today. And I would like to say to all of you that are watching this show, 
with this awesome gentleman, Mr. Ray Copenhaver, who actually taught me the business, mm -hmm. okay, on long-term care. I am so serious. Um, you can roll the dice if you want, but it remains an issue of the elephant in the living room. Do not talk to me about your investments when you have not taken care of something as foundational and fundamental as long-term care. For those of you that have parents, you would probably want to consider paying the premiums yourself. Do not be frustrated uh, and intimidated by anything you've heard. As I will share with everyone, knowledge is power. Get